All right. The four Cohen brothers, Lowell, Norman, Hiram, and Max, invented the first efficient automobile air conditioner. On August the 15th, 1939, the temperature in Detroit was 92 degrees. The four brothers walked into Henry Ford's office, convinced him to come down to the parking lot to see their automobile, convinced him to get into the automobile, which at the time was probably 100 to 120 degrees inside. They turned on the air conditioner and cooled off the car in just a few minutes. Henry got very excited, invited them back into his office, offered them $2 million for the patent. The brothers refused. They said that they would settle for $1 million, but they wanted recognition on the label of the air conditioner. They wanted it to read the Cohen Brothers Air Conditioner. They wanted that on the dashboard of every Ford who had an air conditioner. Two million. I think you know the history of Henry Ford. There was no way he was going to put the Cohen Brothers' name uh, on two million Fords. So they haggled back and forth and, oh, after a couple of hours, they finally came to an agreement for three million dollars. And they would just put, he would just put their first name on the air conditioners. And so to this day, all Ford air conditioners show low, norm, high, and max. <laughs> I'm shutting this off. <laughs> Remember a couple of weeks ago um, when the Tigers were playing the White Sox at Comerica Park and the season is winding down, down and they're in this heated race to be the division champion uh, and, and winning games was crucial and it seemed like they were losing more than they were winning. We were holding our breaths as Tiger fans, and on this particular day, Justin Verlander was pitching against Chris Sale. Remember the game? White Sox are winning one to nothing. Tigers are, they just look lackluster. I remember sitting and watching that game and thinking, oh man, they're gonna lose another ball game. Uh, and then it was the sixth inning, and the White Sox pitcher hit Victor Martinez with a pitch in the shoulder. And uh, as Martinez was walking slowly to first base, uh, the two ball players, they started jawing at one another. And um, the conversation escalated and they were yelling and you could tell they were angry. And Chris Sale, he points to center field and Something is agitating him. Later we find out that he thought that someone was in the bleachers with binoculars giving Victor Martinez a sign. Anyway, the argument continues on and tempers are uh, rising and people are upset and suddenly the bullpen empties and the men on the bench empty and they're all congregating on uh, and the infield, and it looks like they're going to have a brawl. <laughs> uh, unlike hockey, baseball players, they don't usually fight. But um, I watched and I thought, oh my, who's going to throw the first punch? Um, well, there was no brawl, and soon the ball game resumed, and uh, that was the turning point in the game because our Tigers went on to win 6-1, to one, and Chris Sale got knocked out of the game. Um, this story got me to thinking uh, about how baseball, in so many ways, mirrors life. Now, granted, in this particular game, it was a little unusual. I mean, he thought someone was in the bleachers with binoculars, cheating. But for just a moment, think with me. 
heated arguments and fisticuffs in baseball, it, it's, it's kind of the way it is in life. Things like this really do happen. What, what starts out to be an innocent disagreement, uh, something happens in an otherwise uneventful, ordinary day, um, things escalate, and you get angry, and I mean, it's to the point where you, you're going to blow a fuse. What do you do? How do you face that confrontation? This morning, I want us to look at Genesis and this account of Joseph, and I've given, it, given some of it to you in your bulletin. You can't find a better lesson on how to handle hard times and strife. I mean, this Old Testament character, Joseph shows us how. Now, now remember, this is Joseph. Don't confuse him with some other Josephs in the Bible. This is Joseph with the coat of many colors. Um, this is the guy who was sold into slavery, spent time in jail, uh, was released, <laughs> ends up vice president of Egypt. The guy has an amazing story. So I'm titling this message, The Joseph Paradox. In this story, we meet Joseph, a man who stoically accepts his reality while maintaining an unwavering faith. This is the paradox. <laughs> now the scripture lesson is from Genesis chapter 45. We're nearing the end of the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph and his brothers have been reunited. Nothing like a family reunion, except in this case. It's a little strain. And Joseph is now about to explain what happened in the past and why. He says in verse 4, come over here. So they came closer. He said to them, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into slavery. Talk about an understatement. I am Joseph, your brother who was sold into, uh, sold into slavery. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you probably remember, maybe from Sunday school, Joseph is the son of Jacob and Rachel. He has 10 older brothers, and the brothers are extremely jealous of Joseph. Joseph is kind of the favored one. You know, uh, mom and dad, they just kind of, well, actually, he was in line for the bulk of the inheritance. Uh, the 10 brothers didn't like that at all. And they just kind of favored him. He was the golden boy of the family. Uh, and, the, and the complete story, you've got to read it, um, talks about his experience. And it begins with this unexpected confrontation. One day his dad says, now Joseph, I want you to go out there, find your brothers, and take them this lunch, and see how they're doing, and report back to me. Sounds like an easy task. There's nothing there. Uh, Pretty simple, go out, check the boys, look at the flock, come back and report to me. So what starts out as just an innocent, <clears throat> uneventful, ordinary day ends up with an argument. Tempers are flaring. Someone gets thrown <laughs> for a loop. It's a story about Joseph and how he survives all this. In Genesis 37, Beginning with verse 18, it reads like this. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance and made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they exclaim. Verse 20, come on, let's kill him and throw him in a deep pit. We can tell our father that a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of all his dreams. So the... Picture with me now, so the 10 brothers, they wait till Joseph gets close, they close in on him, they grab him, there's hustling and bustling, there's struggling, and Joseph is crying out, and he said, what are you doing? And they're angry, his 10 brothers, they grab him, they throw him in this dry well, and before they can finalize their plan, 
with murder, along comes this caravan headed for Egypt, traitors. And one of the brothers says, hey, he may be worth more alive than dead. Let's sell him as a slave. Then we'll go back, we'll tell dad, well, here's this coat of many colors and there's blood on it, goat's blood. Uh, we'll just tell him that a wild animal ate him. Years go by. And now we're here to Genesis chapter 45. And Joseph confronts those same 10 brothers. And he says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt, into slavery. That's it. I'm Joseph, your brother. You sold me into slavery. Not I am your brother, the guy you grabbed and threw in a pit and threatened to kill me. I am Joseph, the one you manhandled, the one who, the, the, the one who you terrorized and beat up. I am Joseph, the one who came this close to murdering me. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Wow, that speaks volumes. This is the Bible's way of telling us how Joseph handles a crisis. He approaches this crisis in a very simple way. Uh, good or bad, you take what life hands you. So when the dust settled and Joseph was on his way to Egypt, though the Bible doesn't give us the details, I think Joseph, on his way to Egypt, sold as a slave, has resigned himself to the fact that sometimes that's what happens in life. Bad things happen. And, and because bad things happen, you've got to make an adjustment and move on and do the best that you can. Hey, friends, good and bad in life, they happen, don't they? <laughs> You're probably thinking right now of a trial you've been through or something that you're facing. Bad things happen to good people. No one's immune. It can happen to the pastor. <laughs> it has. <laughs> and sometimes bad things happen and it's not because we've been sinful. It's not because we've made good or bad choices. It's not because we've been disobedient against God. It just happens. That's the kind of world we live in. Sin has affected our world in so many ways. There is no utopia, not this side of eternity. And yet, God is in control. And what Joseph is telling us is that God will help us. The next verse in our lesson, verse 5, the words of Joseph, again, talking to his brothers. But don't be angry with yourselves that you did this to me. For God did it. He sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Now, that's an amazing statement. It's absolutely true. Uh, it was easy for Joseph to look back over the years from the moment when his brothers grabbed him and threw him in that pit and all the years and all the events that followed. He's looking back and he's seeing how God's hand was, you know, if they say hindsight is 2020, well, it is. And I think that there was also a period of time in Joseph's life Joseph's life from the incident at the pit to Egypt when he wondered, had no idea what was going to happen next. And these few words, verse 5, words of comfort to his brothers and an explanation to his brothers 
of why this all took place. Joseph going through some dark days, no end in sight. Joseph didn't know what God's plan was when he started out. Hmm. I, I, I can just see him scratching his head and wondering, is God behind all this? I mean, he'd been taken prisoner, tied to a camel, went to Egypt. And, and following that, he worked for a guy by the name of Potiphar. Remember the story? Potiphar and his wife, we won't go down that. That's another sermon. I'll save that for later. But uh, he, he was a servant, a slave. And then he was in prison, for, in jail for something he, he did not do. I mean, he faced the unknown. And he came through this period in his life. Uh, I would have gone bonkers. I really would have. That would have drove me nuts. But he, he came through on top. So what do you do when you're facing a trial and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight? And it's scary. I think we're all familiar with the poem by Joyce Kilmer. I remember having to memorize this in school. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. You know the poem. And then remember how it ends? Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. 25 years after that poem was published, Ogden Nash um, published his answer to trees. I think that I shall never see a billboard lovely as a tree. Indeed, unless the billboards fall, I'll never see a tree at all. <laughs> that kind of sums it up, what it's like uh, living in the 21st century and going through some difficult times. We're walking down Rhodes life and here's this huge billboard, this unsightly, ugly billboard. It's right in front of us. We can't see what's on the other side. All we can see is the billboard, the trial, the test. <laughs> I don't know what's on the other side. Don't have a clue if I'll ever see another tree. <laughs> We've all been there, haven't we? Yes, we have. And we know from experience that an uncertain fate with no uh, end in sight, that is scary stuff. A few centuries earlier, a guy by the name of Joseph went through it. And then later on, St. Paul probably thinking about Joseph, pray for those who are going through dark times. In Colossians, we have that prayer. Um, this is St. Paul, and he's looking down at this long, dark tunnel, and uh, no end in sight, and he prays or gives us this assurance. We also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so that you will have all patience and endurance you need. Hmm. Praying for strength and for endurance. Praying that God will meet all the needs. And then he went on in his prayer, may you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father who has enabled you to share the inheritance that belongs to God to God's holy people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. Hmm. We can choose to live our life in darkness and the tough times, or we can choose to go through the dark times, the hard times, remembering that we have Christ and he's our strength and he knows how the story ends. I, I was in a conversation yesterday with someone and I just glibly said, 
Well, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And they smile, but listen, sometimes we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's still dark. We may never see the light at the end of the, end of the tunnel. We may never experience the ending that we want. But what keeps us going is the promise that God has rescued us. God has purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven all our sins. There's an amazing story. Admiral Jim Stockdale, I read his book. He was the highest ranking uh, US officer, military officer that was captured uh, in Vietnam during the war. He spent eight years in prison, Hanoi Hilton, only it was not the Hanoi, not the Hilton that we uh, would like. And during those eight years, he was denied all freedoms. He was tortured terribly. Many times he was in solitary confinement, um, humiliated. There was no certainty that, that he would ever survive this ordeal. I mean, his, there was no light at the end of, end of the tunnel. There was only blackness and pain. And then it was all over. And the POWs were released and returned to the United States. And Stockdale was one of the survivors, obviously. And, um, but there were so many that did not make it back home. They broke under torture. They died in prison. Anyways, he was asked how he managed to deal with his ordeal. Uh, and this is his reply. I never lost faith in the end of the story. And then Stockdale was, Stockdale was asked, well, who didn't make it back? This is his answer. Let me read it to you. Who didn't make it back? That's easy. The optimists. They were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come, and Christmas would go. Then they'd say, well, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come, and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, and then it would be Christmas again. And then they died of a broken heart. Now, listen closely. Stockdale went on to say this. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Now, this is coming from a soldier. He's not a theologian. He never preached a sermon at church. At least I don't believe he had. Uh, I mean, he fought wars. But man, this is a sermon that he preached in these few words. Uh, what a message. Hmm. This one little verse in Genesis, it sure gives us a clue as to how Joseph handled his crisis when there's no end in sight. I think Stockdale, a prisoner of war, during Vietnam, he got it right. Joseph confronted his reality. He faced his present head on. He did all this even though there was no light at the end of, end of the tunnel. Finally, Genesis chapter 45, six and seven. Joseph is talking to his brothers. He says, these two years a famine will grow to seven, during which there will be neither plowing or, nor harvest. God has sent me here to keep you from, keep you and your families alive so that you will become a great nation. You confront the reality, but you don't stop there. You exercise, friends, believe me, you exercise an unwavering faith that somehow in the darkest hour, there is an end to all this. And in this passage, Joseph 
is telling his brothers that in the end, they didn't send him to Egypt. It was God. And because it was God, Joseph had a faith that there was a reason for all of this. He said, God has sent me here to keep you and your families alive so that you will become a great nation. What an unwavering faith in God that God would not only bring him through the trial, but it would help his family through a terrible famine and they would become a great nation. This is the kind of faith that we need as a church. I was thinking about our little church and what we're going through. And it is tough. And some of you, you probably had thoughts, well, there's going to be an end to all this and I don't want to be around. It's so sad. One day we'll have to close the building and turn off the lights. And I think this is a good message for us. 